Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to a new week of studies. As we begin to look at part six on Jacob's sheep, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his direction and his guidance so that we might try to understand that which is being presented? Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, creator, God, we thank you for the hours of the Sabbath that are past. <clears throat> and for the, the days of this new week. We ask, Father, today for your guidance and direction so that we might more directly understand this that is being presented. Help us now as we study. Help us and direct us so that we may all be able to discuss and cover points that we see within this presentation. Help us to keep in mind those things that you would want us to address. May your will be done. I pray for a blessing upon each one that is attending this meeting and for those that will view this later. Help us now, guide us, so that we might more clearly understand how we are to study as well as how we are to relate to others. Be with us now. May your spirit, your Holy Spirit, Guide us. May your angels attend us. For this we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, as we begin to look at this section, I find it interesting because of the presentation that I attended yesterday and then the conversation that, that I was involved in after the presentation. It seems a couple of weeks ago that there was a, a discussion that went on at a camp meeting where Walter Weiss and, um, trying to think of the other, the other uh, presenter's name. Um, anyway, two, two very specific voices. Conrad Vine. Conrad Vine. Yes. Thank you where they were addressing very specific situations that have occurred. And one of the things that I was struck by in Walter Weith's presentation was how he had addressed the situation that occurred between James White and Uriah Smith when James had disagreed with Uriah Smith on the King of the North becoming Turkey. Now, to be direct, the party that has written these articles lives in an area where his time zone is one hour different from mine, which makes it, you know, substantially different from yours, Stephen, or from Theodore's, or from those that are on the East Coast. And it would be nice to be able to have him attend so he could explain some of what he's what his thinking is because we're not trying to be critical we're not we're not trying to tear anybody down we're just trying to understand exactly what's being said so it'd be 5 30 in the morning right correct now. that's correct of course he could watch the videos and he could comment and clarify things that's true i'm just i'm just you know Having the, the thought process, I mean, Mrs. White was not telling her husband after he gave this presentation that was in opposition to Uriah Smith's point that he was wrong, mm -hmm. but she was saying that he could have handled it differently. Yeah, and when you look at, at what he said, you can see that that would be the case. Right, but there are those that don't want to take it that way. So our situation here is we're trying to understand what Glenn has written. Mm -hmm. I, for one, I'm, I'm, well, I am trying hard to understand. There's just so many, so many kind of holes that I'm seeing that I'm having difficulty following what's being said. Yeah. Well, sometimes, you know, when, uh, you know, I figure something out and I, I share it, um, there might be holes, like leaps that I don't you know, make connections when I present it. And then, you know, you present it to a lot of people and you start to realize, well, I need to fill in this information. I need to show this step. 
it's not obvious to everyone. Right. Right. That that type of thing. So so hopefully, you know, he welcomes this this uh analysis of what he's written. Okay. Now, as he's presenting here. The account of Jacob's sheep while working for Laban is a small part of a much larger narrative of Jacob's life and can be viewed as a type. Looking at types seems to be a recurring theme in each of his presentations. The reference point for this is his wrestle with Christ, also known as Jacob's time of trouble. The time frame for Jacob's time of trouble is just after the universal Sunday law is passed with its accompanying death decree for those who refuse to worship on Sunday. Jeremiah 30, verse 7, early writings, page 36. This reference point gives us the key we need for the overall picture of his life. And using this key allows us to work back from that time period to examine other spiritual truths in his life in the context of a type. So that means he's putting these on a line, right? So he's going to take life, put it on a line. He's going to address, you know, there's two periods of seven years and and all of these different things, which, so I've gone through it. And I, I think it's actually quite a reasonable idea he has in this article. Okay. He didn't draw a line for us, though, right? It'd be nice if he did, but. Right. He does not draw a line. Now, I find it interesting because there's a presentation many years back. I believe it was done by Dwayne Dewey that gave the point, as they saw it, that the seven times of Leviticus 26 is something that we would see in the very, quote, DNA, unquote, of Jacob's life. So taking this, if it had been placed upon a line, but presuming that we have the ability to consider it on a line would be a point for our consideration. These literal events in Jacob's experience provide for us the spiritual way marks we need that allow us in turn to test our own corresponding experience. Would we agree or disagree with this statement? Well, we would. Obviously, there's our own experience, and then there's the, the experience of on the bigger line. Right. So they So I'm not sure which he's referring to. Is he talking about our own experiences in the individual or talking about the movement? Okay. And that's not sure what he's, what he means by our own. Okay. Because that could be a group or that could be the individual. There's no way to tell. All right. At first glance, you might wonder what bearing this article could possibly have to the study of Daniel 11, 31 to 45. Hopefully the correlation can be seen between the experience of Gideon's men and that of Jacob's sheep. Understanding as a type that in both cases, the water is the word of God is really the smaller key that unlocks both accounts. In the first account of Gideon, it is the way in which each man drank out of the water that is that determined whether he would advance or not. Likewise, in the account of Jacob, this time, however, it is not the method of drinking, but what was placed in the water that determined whether they would advance or not. Yeah. So he's going to, again, reiterate the idea that we got this understanding of Daniel 11, 31 to 45, and that these different studies that he's doing relate to it, though he never shows the connection. Right. Right. Even in this article. We don't see what he's getting at. Yeah, this this unfortunately is is true. Mm-hmm. Now, if this was if this was being handled as a a legal situation, I would be objecting in this that this is assuming facts, not in evidence. Mm-hmm. But if you repeat something often enough, then people might actually just accept it. <laughs> even even in a court of law. So 
But yeah, so he's never shown us this connection, and he's not going to show it in this article either. He's he's going to state it again at the end in his conclusion, but I don't I don't get it. So, but but otherwise the article is quite good as far as understanding the lines. So there must be some connection that he sees to the lines in Daniel eleven thirty one to forty five, but I haven't seen what that connection is. Okay. The account is found in Genesis 30 and details a similar two-step process to that of Gideon's men. In the first step, Laban and Jacob come to an agreement as to Jacob's wages. So far, all of Laban's sheep are in one group, but according to the agreement, there is to be a separation. They are to be divided into two groups, and one class will remain with Laban, and another class will be given to Jacob. The separation is not based on the fact that there are both sheep and goats in the group, but is determined instead by the color and nature of their coats or their wool. The brown, speckled, and spotted animals are removed and placed in Jacob's care, and the ones that were not brown, speckled, or spotted were left with Laban. Jacob goes so far to state that it is their agreement that if an animal is discovered in his flock that is not brown, speckled, or spotted, it would be counted as stolen. In other words, the end result is Jacob's flock is white and Jacob's, Laban's flock is white and Jacob's is not. Up until this agreement, all of the sheep and goats of various colors have been together, but now they are in two very distinct groups that are in easily distinguishable, all due to the color and characteristics of their outward appearance. Now, if this was placed on a line, if we were to look at this, let's say in light of Revelation, with the sheep being indicative of those that would be God's sheep, would this be a chiastic presentation where those that are white and those that are speckled as they are separated represent two groups and at the end those that are speckled or as we would say in garments that are spotted <clears throat> would be separated from those whose garments are all white Okay, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I understand what you're saying by chiasm is just kind of reversed, um, but I don't think that's the main point of it. I'm just, I, I'm looking at it outside the box. That's all. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying it's his point yeah. or not. So yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure if that's part of the story. It's, I mean, it's just for Laban. Uh, the preference probably is to have white white sheep right and there would generally be more of those right generally yeah yeah so you to have these speckled spotted or brown ones that would be less common so he's he's trying to sort of take advantage again of of jacob right so that's i mean that's the main part but yeah we're going to have the separation of these two classes with the everlasting gospel the three-step testing prophetic message so that's going to happen. So as with the first separation of Gideon's men, where one class of men went home and the other class progressed to the next level. So with the sheep, one class stays home and the other moves to the next level with Jacob. In studying this as a type, the Bible lets us know that sheep represents people. And here we are directed to see Isaiah 53, 6, Ezekiel 36, 37, and Psalms 23. In this case, it is the color that defines the characteristic of each sheep. To put this in perspective, if someone were to ask what color should our robe of righteousness be, we would of course say it should be white, as our robes are to be white and without spot or blemish. So, if these sheep are progressing to the next level, shouldn't the white sheep be the ones that get the nod instead of the brown spotted or, or grizzled ones? It all depends on how you look at it. To understand this, 
is to realize that these white sheep represent a class of people who see themselves in a certain way. In other words, those who see themselves as white only portray themselves as white, but the reality is they are either self-righteous or legalistic. You could say that they are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. On the other yeah. hand... Yeah, so, so I would think that this makes more sense than it's chiastic. Okay. This would be dealing with the, the Laodicean message. So we need to see ourselves as wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Anyway, go on. Be easy well, next. Finish your thought, please. No, no, that's, that's, he's going to explain. Okay. Right? I'm just agreeing with him. On the other hand, those who view themselves as brown, speckled, spotted, or grizzled see themselves as under condemnation. They see and recognize the fact that their robes are not white. They perceive that they have a problem and seem to be unable to grasp the hand of Christ. They see that they are failing to attain to Christian perfection. You could say that this group, that they are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. No white sheep would ever view itself in that perspective. And that is why Jacob could say that if one were found in his group, it would be counted as stolen. And this same concept can also be seen in the selection process with David and his men. David is a representative man and is a type of the 144,000. And as such, it is interesting to note the condition of the men who were drawn to him. 1 Samuel 22.2 tells us that everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him, and he became captain over them. Distress, those who see that their characters do not fully reflect the character of Christ. In debt, those who try hard to keep the law but are constant, that constantly fail as they do not understand true righteousness by faith. They find themselves always in debt to the law. Discontented those who are not content with their present religious experience. It's kind of interesting that, I mean, this is obviously in Hebrew, it's different, but in English we have uh, these three that are alliterative, right? So they all start with the letter D. So would we say that he's, he's using this verse as a, a type of allegory? To this with the 144,000? Yeah. Okay. It's analogous. In order to better understand the significance of the color of the sheep and their corresponding condition, we need to step back so we can see the type of Jacob's life in a larger context. Jacob was first under the direct supervision of Rebekah, and then he was placed under the supervision of Laban. In other words, there were two administrators in his life. Rebecca as a woman and mother represent the church, and she is the one who in induced Jacob to attempt to obtain Isaac's blessing on the birthright by deceit. The fact that she did this lets us know that she did not know how to obtain it for him legitimately. The exile of Jacob from his mother is represented in Isaiah 28.9 as them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. This is not telling us to leave the church, but to study for ourselves and not rely on the church for our salvation. Laban, as the brother of Rebekah, represents the law, as it was Laban who changed Jacob's wages ten times. He did not want to let Jacob go, and it also helps us to understand more clearly why the white sheep remained with Laban. As Laban represents the law, so Leah and Raquel represent both the Old and New Covenants. Just as Laban was the father of Leah and Raquel, so the law is the father or the basis of both the Old and New Covenants. Jacob went for Raquel first, but found that Laban, or the law, would not permit him to take the younger before the elder. Raquel was the pretty one, and Leah was not. In other words, we all want the pretty one, or new covenant, but we must first pass through the experience of the old covenant. 
the study of the children of Leah and Raquel, along with those of their handmaids, gives some very interesting insights as to how the Old and New Covenants work in our lives. Any comments about this paragraph? Um, well, you know, one is we know it with um, uh, Isaac and Ishmael that they're going to have um, these two two different mothers, right? So you're going to have um, Sarah and uh, Hagar, which do represent the Old and the New Covenants. So it's fitting that you would have this parallel here. Though I'm not sure what it has to do with his, like, it's more an aside, actually, to the whole line. So I'm not quite sure how you would fit that in with this line. You understand what I'm saying? Well, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. Yeah. This, okay. this is a great side note, but it it's not germane to the main idea. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, uh, just getting back to the distress. Okay, Angela? A yeah, sorry to butt in, but uh, if God's law is unchanging, what I have a problem with is the law being the wages being changed 10 times. Maybe I'm being too literal here, but that kind of stood out to me. But your point is well taken because the law of God, as you just stated, is not changeable, it is immutable, it is something that remains constant right yes so the fact that laban changed the wages 10 times is not a good analogy with the law of god the wages here were the sheep so you can maybe see that the people were changing in some way okay yeah also you got the 10 times which does relate to the 10 words the decalogue the ten commandments uh, maybe the ten virgins too hmm. i don't know yeah i mean you know obviously it's an analogy and analogies sometimes break down right of course so you look at the symbols and put them into place then it uh i still think it's it's sort of a valid observation now just think uh getting back to this um this illiter alliterative you know the everyone that's in distress and debt and discontented. It's kind of interesting in the Hebrew, uh, distress is metzok, uh, which um, starts, of course, with the letter M while mem in Hebrew. And then debt, uh, nasha, which starts with a noon. And then discontented is two words, uh, mara or bitter, and nephish, bitter of spirit. So you got a mem and a noon there. So even in Hebrew, there's kind of an alliterative connection uh, with those three characteristics of uh, David's men. So I thought that was interesting. Yes, it is. Well, especially, you know, as, as you were just saying about how this with the stressed is made up of two words, right? Yeah. yeah, bitter in spirit, right? Okay, so you've got this, as you said, Mara, which would be the root that we would see later in the Greek for Mary, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah or Miriam. So Miriam, Mary, however, however this is being approached. So yeah. intriguing. Now, just as there was a second step to qualify those who would actually be used in the Battle of Gideon's time, so there is an additional step applied to Jacob's sheep now that they have been separated from Laban's group. In both cases, they are qualified at the water, but this time it isn't based on how they drink of the water, but what is placed in the water when they drink. Jacob uses three special rods to accomplish two specific things. The first objective of these rods is to cause the flocks to conceive and reproduce offering that are of the same color and type, thus increasing the size of his flock. The second function of these rods are to selectively produce a stronger class of sheep, thus increasing the strength of his flock. In other words, the rods 
were only placed in front of the stronger sheep, which would in turn produce strong offering. The rods were withheld from the weaker ones, which would only weaken the flock with weak and sickly offering. It is interesting to note that the weak sheep were put back in Laban's flock. So now Laban's flock consists of white sheep and weak sheep, with the addition of these weaker off-colored sheep. Jacob's flock consists of strong, healthy sheep that are brown, spotted, and ring-straked, grizzled, and so on. When we look at the meaning of the word conceive in the literal context of our story, we can see that it means to become pregnant with, which in turn leads to giving birth to something. In the context of a type, it is the same exact concept, but it has to do with the mind. To form an idea in the mind, to understand, to comprehend. To conceive of things clearly and distinctly in their own natures. To understand, to comprehend, to have a complete idea of. Webster's 1828 Dictionary. These rods had nothing to do with the ability of the sheep to actually conceive as they could conceive with or without them. The important thing is to see the fact that even though the sheep all drank of the same water, it was the three rods that actually caused them to conceive in the desired way. In other words, these rods are the same as the leaven in Luke 13, 21. It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. Note, it wasn't two measures of meal, or six measures, but three. In the application of the rods, there are two distinctions to be made. That is, two classes with two particular attributes are developed as a result of the rods being applied to the water as they drank. These rods were directly responsible for reproducing a class of sheep that were brown, spotted, grizzled, as opposed to white. And they were directly responsible for producing strong sheep as opposed to feeble sheep. Okay, thoughts, comments? I think in the, in the next chapter, Jacob relates that he had some dream. Okay. That he believes it was given to him by God that directed him in some way to this here uh, setting up of the rods. Okay. So my, we're saying, my, in, in, I'm sorry, Dwight. My question is that why would God give him the speckled and brown sheep instead of the white sheep? Because the white think that they're righteous and the speckled and the brown recognize their need of Christ. Okay. That was it. What he 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 said, which I agree. Okay, I apologize. I didn't hear that part. Okay, so let's if we're go, if we're going to consider this as a you know in in this with the time, we need to look at what the Bible itself says. So Genesis thirty verse twenty five, and it came to pass. When Rachel had born Joseph, that Laban, that Jacob said unto Laban, send me away that I may go unto mine own place and to my country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served thee and let me go for thou knowest my service, which I have done thee. And Laban said unto him, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thine eyes, tarry. For I have learned by my by experience that the Lord hath blessed me for thy sake. And he said, Appoint me thy wages, and I will give it. And he said unto him, Thou knowest how I have served thee, and how thy cattle was with me. For it was little which thou hadst before I came, and is now increased unto a multitude. And the Lord hath blessed thee since my coming, and now when shall I provide for mine own house also? And he said, What shall I give thee? And Jacob said, Thou shalt not give me anything. If thou will do this thing for me, I will again feed and keep thy flock. I will pass through thy flock today 
removing from thence all the speckled and spotted cattle and all the brown cattle among the sheep and the spotted and speckled the goats and of such shall be my hire. So Jacob is doing this after the birth of Joseph. Is that not what scripture says? What was the question? Okay. If we're going to look at this as, as a time. Mm-hmm. Okay. Time of Joseph. Joseph is born. I, the, yes, so he's I already served. He served two years. Sorry, the, the two seven-year periods. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He's told him to, right. to leave. The yeah. rest is going to occur over six years. Yes. Exactly my point. So the wages for Jacob were not set until after Joseph had been born. So the right. 10 times that Laban changes the wages occurs within a six year period. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause we have the 14 years, which of course typifies the 25, 20 Jacob, Joseph is born at the time of the end. Right. Right. And then you're going to have, uh, the three angels' messages. So, in the six year period, the point that I'm looking at here from scripture, Jacob is very clear that when he came, Jacob had, or excuse me, Laban had cattle and he had sheep. So, Jacob was not only a shepherd, he was also taking care of the cattle. So, um, yeah, so when they use cattle, uh, the word cattle, I mean, because we're dealing with the translation. So it usually refers uh, to sheep or goats, the uh, Hebrew word 7582. Okay. The, the lesser or smaller is what the word, right? So so I think it, it does, doesn't really refer to what we would think of as cattle. More like livestock has been translated as in many other versions. So we're just what's including that? the sheep and goats and so forth. What, what, what's the word? Livestock is what it's uh, yeah. translated as elsewhere. Yeah, it's just the word itself is usually used here in, in the Hebrew to refer to uh, um, sheep, sheep or goats. That is, it means that they're members of a flock, right? It comes from the Sha'ah to rush by implication, uh, to be desolate. So, but yeah, I'm just saying that, I, you know, how many other animals they had. The main focus here is the sheep, the sheep and goats, not necessarily cows. All right. Good points. I'm just, here again, I'm just going with what I saw directly in these verses. So if this it is- even says, you know, uh, the spotted cattle, all the brand cat, brown cattle among the sheep, right? So it uses the word cattle as referring to sheep. Okay. And And spotted and speckled among the goats. So both the sheep and the goats together are cattle. Okay. Okay. Now, um, so another point that Stephen brought up is that, uh, because this is always one of those puzzling stories, like um, obviously taking sticks and and, uh, carving into them and having your animals breed in front of them isn't going to change the color of them. It's not how genetics works. But in chapter 31, in his uh, dream that he has, Stephen, how do you understand that dream? Because you, you brought it up. 31 verse 10. The narrative you get in verse 30, it seems as if he, it's happening just pretty instantaneously. He's not going to sort of go home and think about it and then yeah, have in a chapter, dream. In, in, and chapter, then, yeah, in chapter. Yeah, in 30, chapter. Yeah. Yes. So when he's discussing the wages initially, he just mm-hmm. says, let me go. He says, no, tell me your wages. And then he tells him this here. You know, dividing the, the flocks and so forth. So it doesn't seem to be any 
time for him just to go home, think about it, and fall asleep, and how God gives him this dream. Yeah. So I think some people would maybe think that he's just sort of saying after the fact, uh, maybe that he was sort of saying this is from God. You know, God gave me this dream. I don't know why. Some people so, think he's, he's not maybe being honest with Laban. Well, so they think that, that yeah. he's lying to Laban about the dream that he had previously? Well, you don't have a, the time for a dream. He just says, and, and after the fact, they had this here right. dream. But how do we know that he didn't have the dream earlier? Well, this is just a matter of uh, speculation, just the way things occurred with Laban and making that deal. You know, yeah. he just sort of says, let me go. But God you know, could have given him a dream beforehand, even before he knew what was going to happen with Laban. Well, that there is a possibility. Right. I don't know. Does Ellen White say anything about about it? No, she doesn't know. Okay. Because that, to me, I mean, I, I don't think Jacob's lying about uh, the dream he had with God. That would sort of be blasphemous. Yes. Um, so, so definitely. Um, now, when he has this dream, it goes, uh, "The angel of God spake unto me in a dream, saying, Jacob, I said, here I here am I." And he said, "Lift up now thine eyes and see all the rams which leap upon." The cattle are ring straight, speckled and grizzled, for I have seen all that Laban doeth unto thee. I am the God of Bethel, right? So doesn't tell us when he had this dream, whether it was before or after his dealings with, with Laban. But it could have been that he had the dream before, and then when the situation with Laban arose, that's why he made that suggestion. That would make sense. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Because, you know, why why does he make that suggestion in the first place? Uh, it seems like an odd thing to do. And, it, and, you know, unless he had a plan or unless he knew that God had a plan. Right. So so I, I would put this dream earlier um, before before he talks to Laban. I mean, Joseph is a dreamer of dreams. And uh, so is Jacob, I guess, in this context. So. So his father has dreams. Joseph has dreams. It, it seems to be an Abraham, right? So, so it, it kind of makes sense that there is this that God speaks to them in dreams. So he would have spoken to Jacob in this dream prior to the situation, uh, basically saying that he he would provide for him, but he wouldn't necessarily understand it until the situation arose with Laban. Right. Does that, that make sense? Mm hmm. OK. All right. Now. The verse. Next referred to. Genesis thirty thirty seven, Reads and Jacob took him rods of green poplar. And of the hazel and chestnut tree. And pilled white stakes in them. Or white strakes in them and made the white appear which was in the rods so this strakes basically he's peeling back the bark would would that seem to be correct yeah in in sort of in uh stripes okay yeah yeah it is interesting that Jacob chose three specific types of rods to accomplish his purpose of increasing the size and the strength of his flock not only did he choose three types of wood, but he did something to the rods that caused the sheep to react in a certain way. He didn't just cut three branches off the same tree, but purposely chose three particular trees and cut a branch from each. He then cut away the protective bark that concealed the white layers underneath. Also, it should always be pointed out in a type that numbers mean something. In other words, Jacob didn't put two rods in the water or five rods. He put three rods in. In like manner, the three angels' messages have a protective layer that must be removed in order to reveal the white or true meaning of these messages. They cannot be understood by the casual or superficial reader. And as such, they require a method that will remove the covering and open to our understanding their true intent. 
So now he's given the inclusion. He's initially aligning or uh, stating that he's going to align the water of which Gideon's men drank with the water of which the sheep drank. Now he is aligning the messages of Revelation 14 with the straight rods. So we have basically multiple um, threads, as it is, being woven within this story. Within this story. Jacob pilled white strakes in the three rods. If you look up those words in Webster's 1828 dictionary, it lets us know that he simply peeled a set of stripes in each rod. The concept is set forth in Isaiah 2810, where it details the principle of line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. These white stripes show that the principle of line upon line is what allows us to see the white underneath the bark. This same concept can be seen when David played the harp for King Saul. David was a cunning player of the harp. That is, he represents a class of people who know how to bring forth a perfect melody from the scriptures using the principle of Isaiah 28. Thoughts or comments on this? It's a little bit scattered, but um, I think I get the idea. I mean, uh, and obviously we would agree with the idea. He doesn't really explain uh, line upon line in the way that we understand it, but I know he understands that the way that we do it has to do with the lines, uh, which most people would just look at it as a passage of scripture, so they wouldn't quite get what he means unless you're in this movement. But uh, so this has to do with um, basically an analysis of God's word, how we study God's word. Now, with the water, I mean, he makes a point about the water. He doesn't really complete the thought about the water. Right. Again, you would say the water is not really the issue in the story of Gideon. It's not really the issue here. It's just that this is the time when the cattle come together. Right. Okay. He's, he's dealing with Laban's flock and his. So they've been separated out, but there's some interaction that happens. Um, and it's not really clear to me exactly how this is working. Because he, he continually, Jacob continually has to separate out the sheep, right? Correct. So so the the white lambs, you know, they're going to be a weaker than the ring straight and speckled. And so he's going to put them into Laban's flock. Yeah, I've never really quite understood the story exactly how it's working, but um, <laughs> something to that effect. All right. Yeah, in some ways, um, Jacob is sort of directing what's happening. Right. It's I mean, God is a part of it, but Jacob is also a part of this. Right. God, he just, you know, God doesn't just have. All of these, you know, sheep become ring straight and spotted, speckled. You know, Jacob has a part in cooperating with God in, in having this happen. Okay. Stephen, did you have a comment? Did I? No. No. Stephen, no. Okay. Just had seen your mic turn off and then, or turn on and then turn off. One thing that comes to me is that the house of, of, of David wax stronger and stronger while the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. So I was wondering if there was a comparison in here too about the sheep mm -hmm. and goats. Probably. Those who follow the spirit versus those who follow the flesh. Well, I guess throughout this, and I I appreciate the way in which this is being approached, that we're dealing with livestock as a as a general term by genesis 32 jacob looks to make a present to esau and he gives of of his wealth he sends 200 she goats and 20 he goats so we have of the goats themselves 220 
we have 200 ewes and 20 rams. So of the sheep, we have 220. And then he sends 30 camels with their colts. And I'm having to assume that that means 30 female camels, since it says 30 milch camels. Yeah. 40 kine and 10 bulls. So kine and bull, I don't think we can apply that as as being sheep because sheep have already been addressed. Yeah. The kine is cows. Okay. And then 20 she asses and 10 foals. So we have 110 delineated animals in in Genesis 32, 15. We just don't know how many cults there would have been with the with the female camels. Yeah. Well, maybe each one of them would have one. That's possible. Yeah. All because, I'm saying, yeah. it, it's not specifically noted. Yeah. Where Where is that? Um, uh, Genesis 32, 13 to 15. Yeah. Yeah. So they're milch camels. That means they're um, they're they're with their colts. So each one would have their colts with them. Yeah. So thirty female camels. Yeah, but they're they're actually uh, nursing. Right. Right. So so that's why that with their colts. Well, that would be a total of five hundred and fifty plus the young camels as well. Exactly. So. All I'm all I'm saying is that obviously with this in consideration, there had to be cattle at some point involved with with some of Jacob's wages. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so in Genesis 30, 38, and he set the rods which he had pilled before the flocks in the gutters and the watering troughs when the flocks came to drink that they should conceive when they came to drink. And the flocks conceived before the rods and brought forth cattle, ring straight, speckled, and spotted. And that so, word cat is a different word than the other word cattle. Okay. Right? So the other word cattle refers to sheep and goats, 7716. Where it talks about the brown cattle from among the sheep. Okay. This word cattle uh, Tzion, uh means uh, to migrate. Connective, uh, it's a collective name for a flock of sheep or goats, also figuratively of men. So again, it, it's a different word, but uh, but it also still generally refers to sheep and goats. But um, but yeah, I mean, obviously he they they have to have other cattle um, because you need you need horses, you need uh, you know, oxen, you need, uh, you know, cows and bulls. Uh, they're part of the clean animals. Okay. And I think most of what he's he's going to take away with him is flocks of sheep and goats. And whether these are involved in the, the ring straked and speckled or whether they're in some other way that he has acquired these, doesn't really say. So, you know. That's all I'm saying. It's just he definitely has has those because of chapter 32. OK. And Jacob did separate the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the ring straight and all the brown in the flock of Laban. And he pulled he put his own flocks by themselves and put them not on two Laban's cattle or Laban's livestock. And it came to pass, whensoever the stronger cattle did conceive, that Jacob did lay, that Jacob laid the rods before the eyes of the cattle in the gutters, that they might conceive among the rods. But when the cattle were feeble, he put them not in the feebler, he put them not in, so the feebler were Laban's, and the stronger were Jacob's. And the man increased exceedingly, and had much cattle, and made servants and men servants and camels and asses. Now the article continues. When you consider how a harp is put together with its strings all lined up perfectly, 
with the other strings, it is easy to see that they are a literal example of the spiritual concept of line upon line. Just as David went to the leadership of Israel playing his harp, so there will be a class of people who take a message to the leadership of our church. Okay. So from the chat, Genesis thirty-two fifteen, two hundred and twenty goats, two twenty sheep, fifty cattle, thirty donkeys plus thirty camels, twenty-two times twenty-two times five times three times three equals two one seven eight zero. The numbers of one eight seven twenty. Yeah, and I mean, he's taken out the zeros. It just makes it easier for the math. Right. Because if you leave the zeros in, you get uh, 2,178,000,000, right? But, um, yeah, so you get all the digits of July 18, 2020. That's a great point. When you compare these accounts with Gideon's men, a couple of things begin to take shape in our minds concerning the importance of Bible study and the way in which we study the Bible. The account of Gideon's men clearly shows us that there is an ordained method of how to drink from the water, or in our case, how to study the Bible. Jacob's sheep and David's harp take that concept further and not only shows us the value of utilizing the principle of line upon line in our study of scriptures, but it also shows us that the application of the three angels' message to our lives will give us something to share with others thus increasing the size of the flock. As we then teach others these principles, they become stronger, and we also benefit from the teaching process and become stronger ourselves. It is the principle of line upon line that allows us to see the true meaning of these three angels. This principle of precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little, is expanded on and put in a practical form through Miller's rules of interpretation. Any comment about what he's what he just stated here? There just seems to be little bits missing. Yes. You know, little connecting links. I mean, obviously we'd agree. We need line upon line. We need to apply Miller's rules. They give us this understanding. I don't know if I quite agree with how he puts it together, but yeah. Um I think he's he's when you go back to the one dealing with the harp, I think that's a little bit of a stretch to try to take that is something to deal with line upon line. I'm I'm just seeing this as a little bit scattered, that he's not progressing from one subject to a related subject. He's trying to interrelate subjects that need more evidence really to to support the conclusion Mm -hmm. yeah we can agree with the conclusion but just how he gets there it seems kind of contrived a bit but you know probably some of our stuff seems contrived (laughs) you know especially if we don't explain it properly right Uh, so so i don't know if if quite we can you know like we have some of these examples here in this this whole story. So we know that the context of this story, that it's dealing with the everlasting gospel, that it is a line. Um, he's not really defining it in the way that we will take a line. We'll say, here is, you know, the time of the end. Here's when a message is formalized, when it's empowered. You know, here's the second message when it's formalized, and when it's empowered. You know, and here's the third message. He doesn't really do that. But we can see the idea that there's this separation and that these represent two classes, right? So this is the everlasting gospel. Just exactly how you would do this. And and even when we start dealing with this this story later with with Esau, I mean, it's not part of this story, right? I mean, we've sort of put it in here. He, he's not addressing that. Um, but, you know, we see the July 18, 2020. Right. Right. And and we know that the connection there, that there is these parallels that we can zoom into a way mark and we can create another line. Right. Now, we know that uh, the time of Jacob's trouble is is going to occur when Jacob is concerned about Esau. 
right? So we're going to deal with the Sunday law that in that case, it's the universal Sunday law. But that is typified in our history with the events that have happened in connection with 9-11 and with this movement, right? So, you know, for instance, when you look at Angela's comment there, she's just talking about what Paulin had said. I haven't heard it, but some he said that July 18, 2020 was a mistake. So supposedly, according to Angela, that's what he said. But we can see how that's the logical conclusion. He, he said it. I was there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I wasn't. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it's not no supposedly he said it. Yeah, yeah, I'm just saying I wasn't there. That's all I'm saying. You can say you, you heard him say it. I didn't. Okay. That, that gives us two witnesses. <laughs> yeah, right. But that, that's not really the point. The point is, it's the logical conclusion that he should come to based on what he has done, right? All right. Okay. And we saw that happen with many who first accepted October 22nd, 1844, and later ended up repudiating it, right? Okay. So, you know, some, some accepted it after the fact still, but as time went on, they just abandoned it, right? They changed their minds. So, yeah, okay, I guess, you know, we, you know, we had this time setting, you know, we, it, Jesus could come back in yeah, 1851, but if he doesn't come back in 1851, then obviously we were wrong with October 22nd, right? That's the way I understand happened in Millerite history. So people who had joined with the whites to some degree in, in accepting uh, October 22nd, how much they understood the sanctuary, the different people and individuals, I don't know. Um, but uh, when we when we look at this story that that later with Jacob and Esau, we can see this July 18, 2020 symbol connected to it. And I think that's an important uh, point that in some ways, like when we were going understanding the lines, we didn't go through this story in detail. Right. Uh, we ended up going through a bit more quickly at first. It was not until we got to judges that we really started um, uh, spending more time to address every detail of every story. So, I mean, some of these stories we could go back and look at. And part of it is I'm thinking, you know, in connection with what we're going to study next, I, I still puzzle over what we're going to do uh, in our study, whether we're going to move ahead to First Samuel you know, after studying judges and then taking this uh, sort of uh, interim period where we studied uh, Daniel's last vision. And now we're studying, you know, other people's comments. Um, but this, this, you know, so there are things that we need to re-examine. And this might be one of the stories, even though we're kind of examining it now. But as far as drawing these things on a line. Okay. We have a lot of loose threads that we still uh, need to pull at. There's a ton of loose threads in this, and on that I agree. Yeah, yeah, and in, in our experience, I'm saying though too, in what we have studied in the past. So you know, the thing about uh, your friend here, I mean, I like what he's doing. I think you know the one advantage we have is we study together as a group. I mean, I know if I was just studying on my own. I, I wouldn't have learned the things that I've learned, right? We, we all agree with that. Right. You know, there's, there's an importance of studying together, which is what we're doing is following the counsel Ellen White gave that she followed, that the Millerites followed her group in, in 1850, right? Where they came together, they tried to figure out their disappointment. They, they nailed down the truths they made the 1850 chart, and then, um, and I think that's that's the history we're still in. Okay. Under the, I got a, I got a question that, about about that 22 times 22 times five. What's the five and the three and the th other three? Was it 50 cattle? 30 donkers, donkeys, 30. Oh, so he, did, he just took out the zero. Okay. Yeah. You, if you put the zero in, you still get the same number. You just have um, okay. additional four or uh, five zeros. That's all. Okay. 
So you, you, you don't really need the zero. The zero doesn't affect the, the, the numbers themselves. Okay. <clears throat> Under the subheading of conclusion, just as Jacob chose three distinct trees for his rods, so Christ has chosen three distinct messages for us. These three angels' messages are composed of three separate components, each representing an experience we must pass through. Understanding that the three angels are identical with the sanctuary allows us in turn to understand the function of each. This is the result of removing the protective bark, which then allows us to see the white underneath. Though there is much more to the type of Jacob than can be presented here, it is significant that he had to first pass through two seven-year periods with Leah and Raquel in their order before he was qualified to wrestle with Christ. Okay, so at this point here, right? So he's not really putting this properly on a line. Correct. Um, because we have two seven-year periods. But then we have, you know, the three messages that is actually uh, qualifying him to wrestle with Christ. Right? I I would agree on that point. Yeah. Yeah. So he the two seven-year periods are are actually in a sense they're the punishment for his deceiving his father right deceiving his father yes yeah okay but when and, he, go ahead well and, and so you know we would look at them as the 25 20 curse right i mean he receives this curse but it's the three angels messages that that are that follow that where he's actually in that history, of course, part of the 2520 is, is also receiving that punishment. But, um, you know, Jacob has a change of character, right? Okay. When he wrestles with the angel, he's now called Israel, right? He has a name change. So and that, that name change is indicative of a covenantal relationship. Right. And, and, and we, so we have in our history, we have a repeat of the three angels messages. And, um, and yet we one thing we've we've never I, I've addressed it in my personal studies, but we've never addressed it as a group, is that um, every time you have a three angels messages, this part we've addressed, you always have a falling away that occurs. Right. And we see this and there's usually either a building that's that occurs, like the building of the streets and walls or some kind of a destruction that occurs. Right. Okay. Uh, of a building. Right. And. And we can see in, in Adventist history, you have the three angels' messages. And then you have uh, the first, second, and third angels' messages being rejected. You have the establishment of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 1863. Um, and then you have a progressive destruction of four. The four generations of Adventism continue. And then you're going to have a time at the end. And then you're going to have another history, the repeat of the three angels' messages. But we still have another line after that. Right, which we've never we've never drawn out or addressed, and uh, you know that final we we say the Sunday law is the empowerment of the third angel's message, but that Sunday law is is again progressive, and we get to this time of Jacob's trouble. That's during the universal Sunday law, right? That's how we understand it. Okay. Satan's personation of Christ occurs at that time, according to. Uh, the chapter, the time of trouble, or I think that's the title of the chapter in the Great Controversy, right? Dealing with the time of Jacob's trouble. Yeah, so so it's demonstrated that he has a change of character when he's going to wrestle with Christ, right? So so the, all of this preparation to have that experience and that experience. So in some ways, we can say the empowerment of the third angel's message really actually happens at the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, now, yeah. first to address two items from the chat and then a comment of my own. So the first item from the chat, sheep and goats are sanctuary animals and camels represent Islam. Now, the second comment was that Jacob had a change of character before wrestling with Christ. He could not have borne this without such a transformation of character. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm, I'm assuming. 
Yeah. Now, I agree with the, the situation about this with the two periods of seven times represented by the time that Jacob first works for Leah and then for Raquel. Now, the third period in which he is working is he is working for his wages, right? Mm -hmm. Yet, what is what are the wages of sin? Well, the wages of sin is death. Right. But I, I don't know if I would relate these wages here with, with that. All I'm all I'm trying to do is to apply this with the third message. Because first message, fear God. Second message, give glory to him. Third message, for the hour of his judgment has come. And under judgment, you're either you're either found not guilty or you're judged to death. That's just the way my mind thinks. So I'm asking if that's, you know, in, in this type of a situation, another example of the three messages. So I'm basically what he's what he's stating here is that he had to pass through the two seven year periods before he's qualified to wrestle with Christ. But isn't there actually three periods before he's wrestling with Christ? Yeah. Yeah. So you, I mean, you could, you could apply it that way. Okay. So when we, when we look at a line, right, those two periods, they represent the 2520s, the 220 to 21260s in a sense as well. Correct. Right. Of right. Paganism and papalism. So when you get to the time of the end, that's going to be when Joseph is born. Now, of course, we're dealing here with Jacob, not Joseph, per se. Um, but, uh, you know, so, you know, these lines, in a sense, overlap. So sometimes you just have to really define where in a line you're looking at something. But, yeah, there are three periods, and they can represent that. And the progressive destruction of four, that, that period of of the four, seven times, let's call it that, is is a chastening period. So Jacob has a chastening period. And then he has a period in which he enters into a covenant with God in, in the sense with the wages, right? He's going to have three messages, these three, um, uh, you know, rods, right? Representing the three messages. He's then going to wrestle with Christ and and then we're going to have, um, uh, you know, his reconciliation with Esau. So, um, you know, there's just other lines there as well. Yes. Yeah, way into the, I think it's the most holy place in Ezekiel's temple. You have a period, sorry, not a period, a, a length of 20 cubits. And that's right. divided with uh, a doorway of six cubits. On either side of that, you have two period, two uh, lengths of seven cubits. So you have seven with seven and a six in the middle there. This kind of correlates with uh, the time period of these 20 years. Okay, seven, seven, and six. So taking 20 years and dividing it into seven, seven, and six. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is critical to understand as the same principle applies to us in the study and understanding of our present truth as found in Daniel 11, 31 to 45. The present truth for the Jews was found in Daniel 9. And the present truth for the Millerites was found in Daniel 8. It was only those who accepted the first message and then were benefited by the second that went on to understand and present their present truth in the context of the third angel. To put this in practical terms, it was only those who accepted and received the message of John the Baptist who were then prepared to accept the message of Christ. This in turn allowed them to see and understand when Christ moved into the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. They understood that judgment had passed on the Jews 
and that the Jewish nation was no longer God's chosen people on the earth, likewise for the Millerites. Now, this, this paragraph and its relevance in this doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Now, if somebody can explain that to me better, I would appreciate it, because this, this one just, just does not seem to flow within this type of a, a presentation. Yeah, it doesn't really follow. It, it's kind of he's mixing things up. In in speaking of it in Latin, this is a non sequitur. Yeah, which which he does sometimes. You know, now maybe there's a connection he sees in his mind, but he's not he's not clearly laying this out. Um, so it'd be helpful to have these things on a line. Right now, of course, you can look at you know the message of John the Baptist is the first message, the message of Christ is the second message. But how this exactly relates to this story? where he's placing this, he's not really giving us that information. Right. So, no, obviously, if you don't receive the first message, you can't be benefited by the second. So that's not clearly illustrated in this story. Right. Here again, he states, only those who accepted the first angel could then be benefited by the second, which allowed them to follow Christ in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. They also understood that the door had closed for the Protestant churches, and that they were no longer God's true church on the earth. The same principle with the same consequences apply to us as Adventists. So this is the conclusion, and yet none of this does he address in the story at all. Right. Doesn't show it illustrated or anything. So far in this series of articles, we have looked at cause and effect regarding the present uncertainty and confusion that attends the Adventist interpretation of Daniel 11, 31 to 45. This uncertainty and confusion allows for multiple and conflicting interpretations and can be traced directly to the method used to arrive at their conclusions. We have also examined other factors which influence our thinking as well. Hopefully in this series, the principles have been established well enough to enable us to see the need for a completely different approach than the one we now employ in our study of Bible prophecy. The words of Jeremiah 6.16 certainly apply to us as we seek to understand our present truth in both Daniel and Revelation. Thus saith the Lord, standing in the ways and see and ask for the old paths, where is the good way and walk therein. In our next article, we are going to use these principles to lay out the proposal for the study of Daniel 11, 31 to 45. From this point forward, this series of articles will be focused on the actual study of Daniel 11, 31 to 45. Nice repeat. He's saying the same thing in two different sentences. I, I, I don't know what else to say at this point. I don't know. Now, so this here, which which he's going to talk about the study, which we'll do tomorrow, the proposal, um, this is where he's going to try to to bring together his understanding of Miller's rules, the use of the King James, uh, the daily, and how that relates to these verses in Daniel 11, verse 35 to 40, or 31 to 45. Right. Don't think he really does it, though. But uh, but we'll take a look at that. Last comment from the chat was that I think reconciling with Esau, which may represent many Muslims coming to Christ and uniting with the Christians who remain faithful. Yeah. But yeah, my understanding is that Esau is saved from from what I studied in the spirit of prophecy regarding Esau. So, and, and I don't think Esau was a bad person, right? Um, you know, in the sense of you look at Jacob and Esau. I mean, Jake, Esau despised his birthright. He didn't take it uh, um, seriously. But, you know, he's not a profligate person in any sense. You know, appears to be a follower of God. Um, but, you know, this reconciliation with with Jacob, you know, is in part a the salvation of Jacob 
and Esau both. Right, if you understand what I'm saying. Right. That that um and and so you know I do think reconciliation um with those that we differ with is important as far as us healing spiritually, if if at all possible, right? That is, we should be in a place where we can reconcile with those that have wronged us and that we have wronged. Okay. But uh, so, you know, I think primarily Esau represents that, but also, of course, he represents to some degree the Muslim world. And now I know some people really focus a lot on, you know, bringing Muslims into Adventism using the charts, for instance, to do so. And I'm not, I, I think to some degree, they're sort of misguided how they do that. But, uh, you know, uh, but I guess, you know, it's a ministry that they feel obligated to in some way or led to. All right. Why do you feel they're misguided? Well, just in the way that they try to do it. So, um, like, they try to find common ground between Muslims and Adventists. Um, in, in, and, and they sort of, uh, do a bit of flattering of Islam, right? So, oh, so the I see. I've seen doing that, right? Um, instead of, you know, really showing that, that Islam is how it's in error. So, so I've seen different approaches, I'm not saying everyone, but I'm saying that there are some who, you know, sort of like we all worship the same God type of thing and, um, and I oh, think we it, don't. Yeah, exactly. So the, the Muslims that I've seen, the, the Islamists that have become Advent, Adventists or Christians, even they they recognize Islam for what it is. Um, so they don't think that uh, that approach is the best, right? Well, then they should be the ones that are leading out to to uh, reap their brethren. And they are, right? Okay, so, I haven't been following that. Right. So, yeah, so you see what I'm saying. There's these Adventists who kind of, I think they're a little misguided in, in how they approach uh, Muslims. But anyway, that's, that's my opinion, and I'm not an expert on it by any stretch. Just what I've observed. Okay. Okay. This is Hebrews. Um, chapter 12, verse 16 says, Warns us, no, least there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau. For one okay. more soul, eight, sold his birthright. Right. So, so that's the way he was profane in that he sold his birthright. Right. Yes. Right. But I'm saying he wasn't like this wildly immoral person. But But that was something pretty major, despising his birthright. Yes. Yeah. But I don't think there's any L my quote. I haven't seen any anyway. Where, where she says kind of, he he is he does join with Jacob and uh, buries his father. But after that you don't really hear much of him. After that Yeah, well other, I just remember a long time ago the it does it just explicitly that he's that he's she does say that about Ishmael too. Yes, Ishmael returns to his father's God. Yeah. So, so I could be I could be confusing. I, I could be confusing the two, right? I mean, we know that yeah, if Esau you find any, let me know. couldn't find any place for repentance, though he saw it with tears. Um. So, yeah. So I could be wrong. I could be confusing Ishmael and Esau in my memory from you know forty years ago. Because definitely what he did was wrong, right? And he couldn't, uh, even with repentance, uh, even with tears, he couldn't seek repentance, right? Like he didn't repent. So so I could be wrong there. But, okay, thanks, Stephen. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments at this time? Then shall we close this study in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we have spent together. We ask, Father, for your watch, care, and guidance through this day. Help us to consider that which we have studied and that which you would have us to know. 
May your will be done. May your name and your character be honored by all, all that we do. Help us to this end. For this, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.